So good evening, everyone. It's great uh, to have you with us on this um, Church Action on Poverty session uh, where we're going to be talking about your local pantry. Um, it's wonderful to have so many of you with us tonight uh, joining in. Um, if you do have any questions, do just type them into the chat or we will have a Q&A um, session later on for that. Um, but without further ado, um, we'll get started. Um, so how many people just um, as a bit of a hands up, how many people have heard of pantries before? Have you got them nearby? Have you visited any? Ah, so quite a few people um, already knowing quite a bit about them, which is um, which is brilliant. So um, we talk about pantries really as a community space where local people are able to access food. Um, all of the people accessing food there are members, so they all contribute to help each other to be able to access that food. Um, and they do that by paying a small weekly fee. Um, sorry, I'm just going to let somebody else in. Um, so our network's growing all the time, um, and we've got 70 plus pantries now across England, Wales, Scotland, and also Northern Ireland. Um, and I think particularly with the current cost of living problems um, and people really juggling on low incomes and zero hour contracts and, um, and benefits not, not going up as quickly as, as they might do, um, we're getting a lot of interest in, in, in pantries. And pantries are run by lots of different groups. So we have community groups, we have housing associations, um, we have charities, um, neighbourhood groups. Uh, we work with quite a lot of local councils as well who directly run pantries. And probably about half of our network are church-based as well. Um, so, um, um, so what makes a pantry different? So we probably all know about food banks and um, food banks um, are sadly an important part of um, our society nowadays, helping people to, um, to, to really survive destitution. Um, but they were only really uh, set up in the first place for that crisis provision. Um, and what lots of food banks and, and other groups and churches are um, looking at at the minute is how do we keep going when actually um, every day for some people is a crisis because they don't know when they're, when they're going to be paid because um, um, electricity bills and gas bills are doubling literally overnight. Um, it's very, very hard for people. So how do we, uh, when people are needing crisis provision all the time, how do we move on from that? Um, and so there's a few things really that help um, to make pantries different with that. Um, and I think relationships are key within that. Um, so as Joe will tell us later on and Chris, um, members are really known within their pantry. So it's a place, um, I, I've only, I'm only fairly new to the pantry, uh, but when I was chatting to my colleague Chris, um, he said it's a bit like your corner shop, you know, it's where you go and, and people know you there, um, they talk to you, they see how how you're doing um, and they remember things about you and so actually as well as a pantry providing food pantries often provide far more than that um, and that's really shown in our social action report which we'll um, send out to everyone who signed up for today's webinar and you can also download that from our um, website but it really shows um, that actually um, pantries provide far more than just food um, they're a place where for, for for good well-being, for um, helping people um, on a social basis um, and lots of our members get to volunteer within the pantry so um, they, they're building up skills and friendships through, um, through volunteering which is fantastic. Um, they're member led, so um, we very, are very, very keen to hear from our members um, and often our members will suggest new things. I went recently to Cardiff and some of the pantries there were very keen on looking at, um, particularly when, when surplus food came in that, that people didn't know how to cook. They wanted to learn how to cook that and uh, they were so successful in that that they're able to then make ready meals, which then go back into the pantry for other, um, for other pantries 
voluntary members to use, which is really good. Um, but we're very keen on calling all of our pantry members members. They're not service users. They don't have to be referred to use the pantry. They choose to come um, and there's no limits. So most of our members would come every week. Um, and that's brilliant because that's how we get to know them, how we get to build um, relationships with them. Um, we often call pantries a hand up rather than a handout. Um, so it, it's the idea of that we're all helping each other um, uh, as a community. Um, it's very, very good value, um, the pantry. So most pantries charge between £3.50 and £6 for every time a member goes to visit. But for that, they tend to get between 20 and 30 pounds worth of shopping. Um, and that's actually before all the, all the food price rises. So, so they're probably getting more than that now. So it's really good value for money. And the average family um, joining a pantry saves around 780 pounds a year, which means that that gives them choices to do other things to um, maybe uh, uh, buy new school uniform or maybe look at going on holiday or just not having to worry about are we going to pay for food or pay for the gas bill um, within that. Um, so that's just a few little things that just help to make um, pantries a little bit different. Um, so we've been doing this um, alongside our colleagues uh, at Stockport Homes since about 2014. Um, so it's a tried and tested development process um, and lovely people like Chris and, and some of the other team are able to help churches and other groups um, go through step by step from um, not having a pantry right the way through to opening the door and, and getting the first members through. Um, but we don't stop there. We're very um, keen on building a network. Um, we've got 70 plus pantries now and we want to look more and more at how we can get the pantries to support each other, how we can get that peer learning um, from each other, how um, we can um, I, I'm re we're really keen on not reinventing the wheel. So actually, if, if one pantry's got a good idea, how can we share that throughout all of the network? And we all join together to do uh, webinars like this where we can look at different issues um, and, and support each other. And then we have virtual coffee mornings as well where we can just come for a good old chat because uh, pantry coordinators and pantry volunteers really like to chat. Um, and so it's really nice to do that. Um, so we really have a one-to-one -one development model. Um, each pantry is, is actually quite different. They all have um, the same um, key values in, and, and we're going to talk about those a little bit later on, um, but actually each one is very different, and it, and it um, has a different identity based on its community, based on the members, and based on the volunteers there. Um, but we basically provide uh, a, a business in a box approach so we can give you everything that you need um, to be able to set up that pantry and, and run it successfully. Um, so that's things like all the logos and marketing materials, um, a, a website which you may have seen and a way for potential members to apply to your pantry, um, all of the behind the scenes documents that you need, all the policies and procedures, um, templates and how to do stuff. Um, we've got custom built software which will log how many members come, how often they come um, and all the different things that you might need um, to be able to feed back to your church or to a, a, an external funder who might be helping you set up the pantry um, and then all the ongoing training as well. So um, yeah. So um, any questions so far? I can't see. Let me just have a quick scan of the chat. Thanks to everyone who's just been saying where they are. Um, can't see any questions yet on the chat, uh, but do be typing those in as we go along. And I'm just going to switch over to my colleague, Chris, now, who's going to tell us about how churches are working together um, with each other and with uh, other key partners in, in Liverpool and, and the wider Merseyside area to, to really make a difference. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, if you can see the map, you'll see that uh, the pantries in the Merseyside area um, are grouped uh, on, on, the, uh, on the Liverpool side of the water. Um, we we're not averse to doing them in Birkenhead and spreading our wings to other areas, but at the moment they're, they're all in the Liverpool area and some out towards St Helens. We do uh, ask pantries to work in a designated area 
so that uh, people can only be a member of one individual pantry. Um, and and we the, the model that we have recommends 150 members as uh, the initial limit. Um, if we if we keep to that number, the model is sustainable. Um, and we normally get somewhere between 50, 50 and 80 as an average uh, amount of members that come each week to, to shop with our pantries. So in Merseyside, we now have 23 pantries open. Uh, we're actually opening uh, the 24th uh, tomorrow afternoon. So that'll be, it's, it's pretty much a third of the pantries in the, in the entire nation are uh, centered in Liverpool. So we're excited about it. Um, we, the, the way it seems to work is that um, where you have one or two pantries, the, they germinate, they, they, other people come along, they see how good it is and they want to do it. So that's the way it's worked in Liverpool. We started with two or three pantries in 2019 and have expanded because people like the model. Um, they hear about it, they come and look at one of the ones that are open and they want to start one themselves. So they've expanded quite quickly in three years. We've gone from one or two up to the current 24 as it will be tomorrow. One of the, the key things about the pantries in Liverpool is we've organized them. Um, it, it's actually more that they've evolved uh, in this way, but they are run by uh, three or four uh, individual charities and organizations. So for instance, there are 11 pantries that are managed and supported by St. Andrew's Community Network. Uh, there are four pantries in the south of the city that are managed um, by South Liverpool Food Bank, who obviously run food banks as well. And in the north, in the Bootle area up towards Waterloo, there are uh, currently uh, two pantries, but there'll be five or six by the end of the year. Um, and they will be looked after by St. Leonard's Youth and Community Centre uh, and the good people there. The big advantage of doing it this way is that um, because, let's say, in North Liverpool, there are 11 pantries run by one organisation, um, it gives us the ability to negotiate pricing on the meat and the fresh food that we buy in. It gives us the ability to uh, support each other if one pantry may be not doing so well, another one doing better, because the financial side of things is, is the income from all the pantries is collected by one organization. So if one pantry is not performing or doing as well as another one, it, it doesn't matter so much because uh, the, the I don't want to call them a weaker pantry, but those that are not having so many members um, are compensated by those who have a few more. So that works very well. And one of the things, just to give you an example of, of how this really makes a difference is that I got together with the, um, the pantry leads uh, a couple of months ago. And we had a discussion over the fact that we really felt that the model as it was working was not uh, sustainable. We were not, um, we were not getting enough money in for the money we spend out. We spend about 180 pounds a week for each pantry on the produce and the meat uh, that we then pass the, the, the savings that we do onto our customers from that. But um, the discussion we had was that we needed to increase the uh, month, the membership fee if we were going to be sustainable. But the, the, the leaders of the local pantries decided they didn't want to do that. Even if it meant that they lost money in the short term, uh, and maybe for even longer than that, they would rather keep the price of membership down because they know that people are struggling at the moment and people are already facing increased fuel bills and increased food pricing. Um, it's a difficult time for everyone. So even though it means short term wise, they are not going to be sustainable, that's a loss that they were prepared to do, uh, prepared to undertake so that uh, uh, we didn't increase the burden of the, an increased price on our members. And I think that's commendable that they made that decision. 
Um, I was very impressed. Um, please, because I think it makes a difference to people in this city. So we've kept the price where we can. Um, we can do that because we are organized in the way we are as groups of pantries. We can do that because um, we can get funding from other locations. The, the pantry organizers are not just pantry organizers. They have other um, other things that they do. They, they have debt work, they have welfare support that they offer around, um, and they uh, are charities, so they get given funding from other places to help the work that they're doing. So it's a model that works really quite well. Um, We do have we have <laughs> we have something a little bit different as well in Moses. Like we have mobile pantries. Um, I mention this because you might hear about them. It's not a model we're ready to roll out to the rest of the country, but we have mobile pantries in areas where we don't have a building that we can set up as a pantry, and we're looking at this as uh, a way to uh, make lives easier for people who live maybe not in the middle of the city or in an area we can't otherwise serve. So at the moment, it's something we're looking at. I think it's going to be beneficial uh, and hopefully successful and we'll run it out to different parts of the country. I think the other thing that I really wanted to say before I let James uh, say a little bit more is that what we are talking about at the moment and what we talk about all the time really is that it's not just about food. Um, I, I mentioned before I've worked in food banks as well as uh, in, in pantries and in all that time the important thing is not the food, the important thing is that there are people who are struggling and all our pantries we offer uh, wraparound care and support, we try and get uh, all the pantries to host that advice, uh, welfare support, uh, housing support from local housing associations, anything that we can look at and bring in to help and support our members is important and in a way more important than the food because um, the food will sustain them in the short term but if we can help them with any issues that they're struggling with long term then, then hopefully that will make a bigger difference ongoing. So all our pantries we're looking at now, we were talking about this today, is how we can put more support in for our members in addition to the savings they get with the food. And finally, let me have one last thing. Um, at the moment, as James said, we uh, people will save about 20 pounds or so buying their food from us. That is the same figure as the 20 pounds that people received during COVID in addition to their universal credit. So, and that was a wrench when people lost that 20 pounds. Well, what we're doing is giving that back now. If people have that little bit of money, three pound 50 uh, or four pounds or whatever it is up to six pounds, if we can save them 20 pounds on their fruit with food, we're giving them back the 20 pounds that they might have lost if they were on universal credit. And I'm afraid um, quite a number of our members are struggling to that extent. So. Um, it, it makes a difference. It makes a big difference to them. It may not seem like a lot of money uh, if if you if you've got it, but if you don't have it, that twenty pounds makes a big difference. And that's uh, one of the things that I think is is most important. And uh, being able to do a lot more than just help with food. That's that's it, James. I'm <clears throat> so I'm just reading. A reading a chat at the bottom there and seeing if I could answer it. But... Oh, lovely. I'll come back Thank to that you. answer that one in a minute. Thank you so much, Chris. That was really helpful. And if you've got any, um, Liverpool is really our trailblazer area. It's where we pile at lots of the new things um, happening. So if anybody's from that kind of area and wants to know um, more from Chris, there is uh, going to be time for that at the end. Uh, but thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, I'm just going to invite... Um, Joe to join me now. I had uh, the privilege of going to see Joe uh, down in sunny uh, Portsmouth uh, a few weeks ago um, and it was a, a lovely time there. Um, if you ever get to visit it's, it's a great great city so I can heartily recommend it but uh, before I become a tourism advisor Joe um, 
please uh, save me and just tell us a little bit about your church, kind of what's it like, what denomination is it? Um, uh, North End Baptist Church in Portsmouth is a community, well, it's a Baptist church for starters. We've got a membership of which I am one of them of about um, 50 to 60 members. It's a typical church in the sense of we've got youth activities, we've got a lot of um, different sorts of groups that are run from the church. Um, we used to run a food bank as a church because we felt that was a need. But where we are placed in Portsmouth, we are we decided that actually we are a community church. We are the point of the community. We wanted to be a community hub. And that's the church. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and you mentioned that you were running a very, very busy food bank. What, what um, could you just talk us through a little bit about what was your decision process to think that maybe it was time to move on from from a food bank and uh, and look at a, a more of a pantry model and and just how that came about, if that's okay? Yeah. Um... North Send Baptist Church ran, has run a food bank for um, about six years and in that six years we were we were part of a Trussell Trust food bank we were a little satellite of one of the main Portsmouth food banks in the area um, and in that six years we served um, about 10,000 people in that six years. I came on board um, as food bank manager um, three years ago um, because our minister was doing everything and couldn't sustain running a food bank as well as all her normal ministerial responsibility. So I took over the running of the food bank. Um, <clears throat> and then a year after I started, COVID hit. So we actually had to completely change the way we were running the food bank. We used to have teas and coffees and we were a hub for, for anybody that wanted to come in and we'd have a circle of support workers in, we'd have all these people in that could chat and give advice. Um, again, building with sort of community and trying to access um, how we could help other people, but COVID stopped all that. We were doing a sort of ready to go bag. Um, I've worked all the way through COVID um, we had bags made up for pack sizes because with the food bank we had a food list and everybody depending upon family size got a set list um, but towards the end of oh, I suppose end of to 2019 we started looking at actually there were people within the local schools that we had good relationships as a church with that were saying they had family that would want to come or that needed the help but they wouldn't come to a food bank because there was a stigma to food banks they didn't feel that they meet them they were the right criteria for a food bank um so they would go hungry or they wouldn't feed the kids or um and it was heartbreaking um during COVID, there were also a lot of pop-up food banks with, I don't know if any of you know, the Trussell Trust have this voucher policy. They have to be referred. They have to, they can only have a set number of vouchers. It's very much crisis management. Um, and that all changed in COVID. People were losing their jobs. They weren't gonna get new jobs. So we had to change the way we're working, but we wanted to, get out the other end so um, Tracy our minister and and I did a bit of research looking at um, different models of what we could do um, Tracy had a friend who was running a larder somewhere else there was a local larder that just opened up um, and we decided that we would test the waters and see if this was the way that God wanted us to go if we should go down the the pantry route. At one point we considered still running the pantry, um, still running the food bank and opening a pantry, 
but for us with our limited space and with the limited volunteers we decided that that wasn't the route for us so we then once that decision was made we then looked at um the pantry model and your local pantry and the rest they say is history so to speak um it there's there's the support that's been there all the way along our um Portsmouth is a very densely populated city and I think the whole of Portsmouth we have something like um we're a little island and we've got six postcodes PO postcodes so um the local authority set up the hive um to help with lots of different community aspects and they with your local pantry wanted to set up a pantry in every PO postcode. So when we opened, um, we looked at, we wanted to be community. We wanted to get back out into the community where we were. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to help those around um, and be a hub, a hiving hub again for sort of our community. Brilliant, and you've very much succeeded that from what I've seen when when you <laughs> when I've visited. And um, how was the process of swapping from uh, from the food bank over to a pantry, Joe? How, how did that go? Um, from my perspective, I didn't have a vast amount to do with the backside of things. That was Tracy sorting it all out with Shabir. Um, but where I was involved we had to pack up the two tons of food we had that belonged to the pan the food bank and give it back to the food bank we had to source more food um, so that we could open we had to do a complete retrain of our uh, volunteers and advertise for new volunteers we currently probably have about 22 volunteers we open four days a week we open um, on a Monday, a Tuesday, it's Monday evening, Tuesday evening, Thursday afternoon and Friday morning. So each day of the, the week has part of the day covered. Um, and I forgot what I was saying now. <laughs> um, that actually we had to retrain all our volunteers out of a food bank mentality because pantries are very different. They're not the free food element. Um, we then obviously had all the uniform to organise, the training to do, the, um, with your local pantry you have to have a room that is allocated for pantry so that the food is constant there, it's got to be a static place so we got the flooring refloored, we got um, bits and pieces done up so that actually everything was ready to go and then we opened on the 19th 20th of uh, 20, we closed the food bank on the 1st of april 1919 uh 1921 uh 2021 even and we opened the pantry three weeks later on the 21st of april so we've been open just over a year now Fantastic, fantastic. We always talk about in the team as pantry coordinators yourself, like uh, being super, super women or super men. Um, but what are some of the highlights and the best bits about running a pantry for you? Um, it's highlights and it's um, sad stories as well, in the sense of not long after we opened, we had people leaving us in tears because we'd had a delivery of steak. Um, we deal, all our food comes in from Fair Share, who are the charity that gets it from other big supermarkets and other sources. And most of the food that comes in has only got two or three days in. So um, Monday this week, we had rather a lot of chicken, diced chicken, um, but it had that Monday's date on. So we were able to give it out on Monday and people could choose this um, on Monday. Um, what was your question again, Tori? <laughs> I think you've been answered it, Joe. It's just, yeah, it's just, just what's good about being, uh, being part oh, of right, country yeah. and 
fact that people came in could go away with steak and they they were in tears saying they hadn't had steak for years because they couldn't afford it um the fact of they've got fussy children and you wouldn't buy certain fruit and vegetable because you've never had it before and they can actually um try it without having to to pay as such because with us we charge four pounds and then our bakery that we get from um tesco's co-ops all the zero waste as we call it the supermarkets so i will go out in a few in a, an hour or so and go to a, a couple of tesco's and get their bread or their bakery that goes out from today and it will go into the pantry for tomorrow um that's free and going from a food bank to a pantry we didn't want people choosing food over toiletry so actually having something to eat compared to having a wash we we felt that it's limited but it's not part of their seven blue and three red items that they can choose when they come in um we've got a very active facebook page again it's going back to what james said before about community when we opened the pantry it was the first time people came back in the building Mm. so we had tables in the hall and people were able to sit at tables and talk to people again okay with masks on but they were able to talk to people we could build up relationships they could have fun um we've had um coffee mornings we've had uh for the jubilee we had a really big street party that the church ran um and quite a lot of the pantry members because they're they're all around the church actually joined in and came and were raving about the church the fun day and the pantry itself um, I've just seen a question there how often can people visit the pantry it's just once a week I'm gonna um but yeah we've got a Facebook page if we have a mass of of products um vegetables that people don't know what to do with somebody will put on there um that how can I cook celeriac for instance and all of a sudden you'll get all these other people um come up um but it's seeing people it's the pantry model that we are running is a combination of a hand a hand up not a handout but also we're tackling food waste from the deliveries that we've had from fair share that would go to the um food waste to that would get thrown away we've rescued 19 tons of food in a year so that a food huge amount food isn't it would just get thrown away um and the food we get from some of the local people shops and things if I can go in, I'm a member myself because I live in the right postcode. Um, if I can go away with four pounds worth of fruit and vegetables, then I'm laughing. And that's, nobody knows why people are coming to a pantry. It's, you could be going because you need the food and we all need help from time to time. It could be that you're there just to reduce food going in bin. We started off when we opened with 39 members our first week um, and the last two weeks we've hit over 120 members a week. Um, but yeah, it's seeing people week in, week out and looking at the Facebook page. If you ever want to know what it looks like, I'll put the, the link, but our church website has got a, your um, a pantry tab on the top and there is a little video which shows you what it's like to come into the pantry and all about what the pantry is and how it works. So I'll put that on there so you can have a look at that as well. That's great. Thanks so much, Joe. And we'll make sure that we email out a link to that video as well, because it's brilliant. Um, but um, thank you so much, Joe. I think you've given us such a good insight there into what uh, running a pantry is like. Thank you so much. It's uh, I'm sure there may be a few questions as well that people might want to ask um, 
as we go along. Um, but it wouldn't be a church action on poverty event without a little bit of theology. So um, we're just going to talk a little bit of theology now. Um, there's 2000 verses in the Bible that talk about God's heart for um, those uh, in poverty, um, the injustice that's happening in our world. And I don't know about you, but listening to the news makes me both sad and very angry. Um, and I think uh, one of my favourite verses in the Bible is about uh, when uh, from Micah 6, 8, when it says, what does the Lord require of us? He has shown us, O oh, mortal, what he requires of us, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And this is really, really important to us um, at Your Local Pantry. Um, so Your Local Pantry is part of Church Action on Poverty, but not all of our staff um, have a faith background. Um, and we work very much, as we said, as well as alongside churches, we work very much with councils. Um, we're looking to work with other faith groups um, and with um, with both secular and religious charities. So really, Your Local Pantry is is open to everyone. Um, but, but there is a good um, theory theological basis behind it. Um, I love this quote that you may have heard from Pope Francis that says, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting and dirty because it's been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. And as Joe um, so uh, eloquently said, and Chris, that actually the churches running um, your local pantries are really at the heart of their community. They're um, really working with lots of members who may never have uh, any other interaction with the church, um, but actually it's getting out there and really helping people where they need it most and uh, with all the uh, cost of living and all the difficulties that people are having people in our communities are really really hurting um, but actually this act justly love mercy and walk humbly maps on really well to the values of um your local pantry which is all about bringing dignity uh, bringing choice bringing hope and um, I've added in a cheeky little one of fun, um, which we may get to explore um, in a few minutes. But I'm just very aware that I want to leave lots of time for people who may have questions. Um, but this is the message version of, of that same passage from Micah. Do what is fair and just to your neighbour. And as Joe said, you know, it's, it's all her neighbours. It's the people in her community who are the heart of the pantry, who are the members who are keeping it going, who are volunteering, who have been that. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. Well, what's more compassionate than serving your fellow um, neighbour, coming alongside them, all pooling your sometimes very scarce resources into that membership fee so that with that bigger pot, as Chris was saying, we can go out and buy food that us on our own couldn't afford to do. And don't take yourself too seriously that's something I see so much in pantries and fun uh, may be a strange thing to say. Um, I haven't visited many food banks, but I, I, I don't know if fun is often the, uh, the, the first thing that people may use to describe that. I could be wrong in that, though. But actually, every time I've been to a pantry and I've been lucky enough to, to go to many across the country, um, Fun is something that I always have because it's about um, having a bit of a giggle with the members, having a chat, having a bit of banter with the volunteers. Um, and actually, that can make all the difference, can't it? Um, somebody said, uh, we had a quote the other day, what was your favourite part of the week? And this person, uh, this lady from one of our pantries in Salford just said straight away, it's pantry time because it's more than just food, as Chris was saying, as more as Joe was saying. It's where they get to see their friends, they get to see their neighbours, they get to have a cup of tea and a chat. And also they get some really, really good food that would otherwise have gone to waste. And it means it's giving them choices so they don't have to. Um, pantry shops are really designed not to ever be your main shop, but to allow you to get some of the essentials so that then you can go and do a secondary shop. Now, we do realise that, unfortunately, for lots of our members, that is their only shop. Um, and it does help to do that. But um, but yeah, so I'm just very aware of time. So I think I'm going to go straight into 
Q&A now. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just so I can see everybody a bit better. I can see you all now. Um, so if you want, if you've got a question, um, if you want to raise either a virtual hand or just um, wave at us, um, then we, we would be very happy to, to answer that. Yes, well, oh, uh, we've got Shirley and then Andy, if that's OK. Uh, just, hi, Shirley. Hi, yeah, yeah from Warrington. Um, we're looking to set one up in uh, one of my uh, churches. Um, I've got an idea of the funding, but could you just go through the funding uh, that we'd need in place again to, um, to get us set up, please? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, it's hard, hard. Oh, Christy, do you want to answer that one? No, I was, I was, I was going. I, I met Shirley last week, so yeah. um, um, it's something that that she and I could talk about, uh, and and I I can answer her question perhaps now. It, I suspect this is different in different parts of the country, and it depends what you've already got set up. Um, in Liverpool, when we um, talk to new prospective pantry uh people we we offer a, a basic price of setting up a pantry of between five and six thousand pounds okay. if you were to try and get funding for that that would be the amount of funding we would suggest you look to get okay. obviously it depends um some people have already got some things on hand that they may not need to to get for instance of that five thousand pounds 500 would be for for shelving um, a thousand would be for a fridge, a thousand for a freezer, that kind of thing. Um, if if you have any of that in, obviously, uh, the, the, the amount you would need would go down. But that, to give you an idea, if you're looking for funding, is a basic amount yeah. that, mm -hmm. that, that it would re require to get everything up and running. Would that include training? The, the training is part of what we offer from your local pantry. And there is a franchise fee to, to become part of our organization and for us to support you. But once that's paid, there's a lot of stuff that we do uh, okay. just because we care and because we, we want to. So that's the training cool. is free. I would uh, ha happily come and train your volunteers for you before okay. they switch right. over from food bank to, to pantry. Excellent. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks so much. Um, I've lost, I think, was it was it Andy? Did ha Andy have a question? Thank you, Andy. I'll just uh, spotlight you. So. Hi there, yeah. Um, basically, I'm just interested to know a little bit more about how, um, like, if you were to set one up, how you would then go about actually getting the stock, the food. I know that food bank, um, I know you, you often see kind of like in supermarkets, donation baskets and stuff, and people put donations in and, and individuals donate to food bank and things. And I know it was mentioned about fair share and things like that, but just a, a bit more like how, how do you kind of get the stock? Like how, how does that work? Thanks, so, so, certainly for us, um, we pay um, a set fee every, well, we pay it quarterly, but we pay fair share and they give us the majority of our food because it is um, discounted quite drastically. So you, we pay for a weight and we get a minimum weight. If they've got a massive amount of food, then we get more food. We have um, got a couple of funding bids that we've put, that we have successfully got to enable us to do a top up shop. So we then go out or we've got Tesco's or Sainsbury's that we will do a delivery and they'll drop it off. But it's, um, it's having the connection. So because I managed the food bank before I did the pantry, I had a lot of relationships with community champions from Asda, Tesco's. And when they take stuff off the shelves, they give it away to charity. So if you are in the know, so to speak, or you've got the relationships. And that has taken years to build up. It's not something that my colleague um, has been able to sort of do because she's only recently come on board, so to speak, but it's building those relationships. Um, we've got restaurants that if during COVID um, weren't doing as much cooking, so they gave us their eggs or they gave us 
chicken breast that they had in the freezer. Um, we had a hotel um, at Christmas last year who um, had a Christmas meal booked and people canceled at the last minute because they were scared of COVID. He donated about 50 Christmas dinners um, that we were able to then sort of batch up and put in the pantry. So it's connections as well as top up foods and fair share for us. Can I, can I add something to that? Andy, just to give you an idea, um, we charge between 350 and four, four pounds per person to use the pantry. The math is easier if I tell you in St. Helens, they charge four pounds per member. So if we have 50 members, that's 200 pounds. See how quickly I figured that. So, um, so you've got 200 pounds a week income from the pantry. And so we are aware that most of our pantries will then spend about 150 pounds out of that on fresh meat and fresh fruit and veg. Um, and then it's a matter of where they can get the other food from to supplement that. Uh, fair share charge about £35. I don't know if it's the same for Joe, but about £35 for um, a set amount of food per week. So the, it's the income from the members. If you have enough members, we'll make that sustainable and you'll be able to afford to bring in the food that they need. And because we're buying it uh, at a better price than most people have available to them, we can, we can make it uh, a, a good deal for them. And the fair share stuff, which you get a lot of, makes it uh, economical because um, you get a lot for your 35 pounds. So, um, then build up relationships with other local stores. I know Joe was saying she's got uh, relationships with uh, local community stores, Iceland, Sainsbury's, whatever, because they will they have charitable contributions that they can give and help you out. So it's 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 doable and and uh, it's sustainable if you get enough members and you keep an eye on the the, the money that's going out. I say many of our pantries, uh, are strictly speaking, not bringing in as much as they pay out, and, and we can we can make that work because we have other funding from other sources. Um, and that's that's a big deal for us in Liverpool because um, if we didn't have funding from elsewhere, there wouldn't be enough money coming in. But but there is, uh, and we can keep the price down. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, Paul, I think you were the next person to have your hand up. Paul C on my screen. Yeah. Hi, it's Paul Evans. Uh, apologies for not having my camera up. It's, it failed on me as I joined. Please don't worry, don't worry. Um, yeah, when I was going, um, I mentioned uh, I'm aware that uh, an app called Olio works in in my area. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but ba basically it it collects a lot of um, excess food from Tesco's and other other supermarkets, occasionally restaurants, etc., and then distributes it, that to people who request it via the app, which is which is fine. So my concern would be. As that appears to be working quite well in the area, um, that it, it would drain a lot of the potential top-up source for for a pantry, um, so that the local supermarkets would all be already giving that over, uh, and therefore, what the other sources apart from fair share there might be to get get uh, food from. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you slightly there, Paul. Um, many of our pantries are actually members with Olio, so so that is another source. And when pantries join our network, we give them a list of all different um, uh, places where where they might be able to get food. And um, we also work very closely with a charity called Feeding Britain as well, and and we share their resource lists. So um, it, it it is often a, a bit of a balance to get the right stuff into the pantry. Uh, you have a wonderful volunteer don't you joe who goes around most of portsmouth kind of picking up stuff yeah. but it but, but it is doable um and uh, uh whilst it can be tight sometimes and one of the things we say about pantry is it's always quite exciting what you're going to get because you may get steak one week and 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 then may, maybe not for uh for a few months then so it's, it's always exciting to see what you're going to get um with a pantry but um we're also in uh negotiations with a national supermarket 
blockchain who are really keen um, to uh, invest more in the pantry um, as well. So that will be um, coming out in a Church Action on Poverty mailing um, probably in September, um, but it's it's all kind of embargoed at the minute. But but that's another really exciting development, and we're hoping that that's going to help us to um, to to source different food as well as um, some really good. Um, uh, kind of resources and things like that. Um, thank you for that, Paul. Great question. Any other questions? Uh, just scrolling through. Anybody waving at me or putting up a virtual hand? Um, Doreen's got a question in the chat. Uh, what are the delivery costs, especially with fuel crisis? Do you have your own van or use volunteer cars? Um, Joe, do, do, you, do you want to answer that one? Is that, is that okay? Um, we, I, if I collect from a Tesco's, I can walk by foot, um, and I use my own car and if need be claim mileage or petrol, um, our wonderful volunteer that James allures to, she gets a free shop every week because she goes out six nights a week to five or six different shops every night. So she gets a free shop every week. Mm -hmm. but it's their own cars. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Chris has put in the uh, in the chat as well that a lot of, particularly fair share will deliver um, other places will will deliver as well so it's a bit of a mixture some some direct delivery some um, some not uh, thank you for that Joe and Chris um, Leslie says in the chat uh, do you have to have a dedicated space or is this just for storage um, I'm sorry, Leslie, I'm not entirely sure I understand that, but uh, if I'm answering it correctly, but it, do dive in if not. Um, so the pantries that I've been to have a pantry space, which is for the general public, um, looks like a, a little shop. Um, sometimes that's permanently there, um, other times it's not, and, um, and you kind of wheel out the shelves. Uh, the fridges and freezers always have to be there, but, but they're lockable. Um, and then there's often a separate storage area, um, sometimes on site, sometimes off site, depending on, on, on how it's all set up, where extra food can be stored and, uh, and kind of supported in that. And you, you've got like a, a back room area, haven't you, Joe, where you keep your, your supplies and particularly when you're opening multiple days like you do, Joe, you, you have to kind of separate some off for each day then, don't you? Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Um, Andy says, just to be clear, once we've paid the setup, uh, what are the additional costs we have to make each month or year? So, um, so to set up with your local pantry, um, it's a £2,000 fee to start off with. Um, and that's made up of a £500 um, a year fee. Um, so, so that kind of pays for your first year and then one and a half thousand pounds to help with the setup. So you get the lovely Chris or, or somebody like that to, to come alongside you one on one to support you with that. Um, then the other costs involved uh, would be if you're going to pay a pantry manager or is that going to be voluntary um, volunteer expenses um, heating and lighting um, do you have to pay rent on on that place that you're in or or do you not um, and then as Chris said um, each pantry has um, proper kind of commercial display fridges and freezers so it's really nice for your members uh, to join um, it's got really nice shelving so uh, so members can go along and choose and, and kind of handle the food and and look at that um, and then we also have um, uh, storage fridges and freezers as well so if you've got a big um, a big thing from Tesco's or something like that you can then uh, bring those in so that's where the majority of the cost comes in and, and that's why it's hard to give an exact figure um, but as Chris said it's roughly five to six thousand um, pounds all in um, and then each week you might be using your members money to go and buy some additional food if, if they particularly want chicken or something like that you might be approaching the local supermarket or the local butcher for that um, but the idea is that it is a social business so it should break even um, uh, or, or um, uh, yeah it, it's not supposed to be running at a loss um, within that and we have a special um, uh, 
uh, business spreadsheet that that will help you look at all of this you can feed in all of your fees um, and then there's an annual 500 pounds franchise fee so it's the first year is 2000 pounds then after year one it's 500 pounds in year two 500 pounds in year three and that pays for the software system um, the way you track all of your members coming in and out um, and how much they're paying how much of a difference you're making so you can uh, feed back to any funders about how many families you're supporting, how many people you're supporting. It also pays for um, an ongoing person to keep uh, from your local pantry to keep in touch with you to be that that kind of phone a friend to, to support you along the way. And it also pays for the ongoing training uh, that we put in, the events that we put in, the conferences that we run. Um, so so that's, that's what that kind of annual £500 fee is, is for. Um, Sally asked quite a specific question about flooring for pantry. Um, I, I don't really want to answer that now, Sally, unfortunately, because we, we'd be getting too far into venue specific stuff. So um, we would do either a virtual tour or, um, or, or an actual tour, depending on where you are in the country, to look at the suitability of any things. But there's a number of different things that that we look at um, within that. So um, I don't really want to go into too many specifics on that. Um, Joe, do, do you just want to come in with your um, with your point? Because that, that sounds really important. Um, just replying back to Sue B's, does it have, what type of fridge freezer does it have to be? Does it have to be used, the ones that they use in shops or could we use our own fridge freezer? We, um, as part of our funding bid, we actually paid for a proper, glass doored commercial fridge and a glass door freezer so that people can see what it is without having to keep opening the doors and also that's what the commercial fridges and freezers are for so that they're opened a lot more than your general use fridge at home would be so we decided to pay out the extra for those reasons yeah we we strongly advise that because that that's part of the bringing the dignity that's part of that kind of wow factor of coming into a pantry that oh okay they've they haven't gone for the uh they've gone for a custom thing for us and we work with a number of companies who give us a discount on that um so again that you would get that discount put on as part of uh, the benefits of, uh, of being part of our network which which you wouldn't necessarily be able to source on your own um and uh, and yeah we'd be able to kind of advise you on which ones to get and everything because we've been doing this with 72 pantries so far so we've got that kind of institutional knowledge of what what works well what doesn't go so well um, and, and we're very keen to learn on when things don't go well and, and how we can um, prevent other new pantries go, um, making any similar mistakes then so uh, so, so that's really all all the things that that you're buying in when, when you become part of your local pantry then we're just two minutes over um but I'm just, I feel there's one more question lurking, but I could be wrong. I think I'm wrong, um, but I'm, um, I'm very happy just to stay on a little bit at the end. Uh, people may not want to uh, ask questions in such a big group. Um, thank you all so much um, for coming tonight. We've really uh, enjoyed having you with us. Uh, I've just put a number of links in the chat and we will send this out as an email to everybody. Um, but just what the next steps might be. Um, if, if you're interested in what we've been saying, um, probably the easiest thing to do is to go onto our website using this link here um, and go onto our inquiry form um, and that just helps us just um, collect a few little details about yourselves and then what we, we will do is we will send you a copy of our brochure, um, a copy of our social impact report and a copy of uh, the financial spreadsheet so you can actually put in some of the figures, um, yes do you need to pay rent in your church, no that's okay um, and put that one in. Um, if you want to uh, 
read the social impact report before you do that. Again, you can download that from our website with that second link. Um, and then the third one is, is just our general website link um, where you can have a look at an interactive map to see what, which pantries are in your area um, already. Uh, you can read lots of news stories and um, see, just get a bit of a glimpse uh, as to what's happening. Um, I, there's also lots of stories and information on our social media as well. Um, Jo has very kindly shared her email address, which is really, really kind, Jo. Thank you for that. Um, if you've got any uh, questions for a pantry expert. Um, but um, other than that, uh, I'm going to draw everything to a close. Um, but I'd just uh, love to pray um, just before we leave, if I can find the right prayer. Um, so uh, we might just want to bow our heads or however you feel most comfortable. Uh, but this is a prayer from St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands and yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes and you are his body. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on the world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Amen.